So thank you very much for that very kind introduction, Tom. Thank you very much to Ed Centuri, but also to the Institute for Freedom and Community for inviting me to come. Uh, I know this is uh, not exactly uncontroversial stuff, and that's what I think is exciting. Um, you know, in my book, I try to create in a debate. I, I want to engage this debate. I want to, uh, to, I know that at the end of the election, there's a lot of seeking out of knowledge of how can we understand the result that we just saw, but also how can we understand each other as fellow Americans? How can we understand each other's choices when our choices seem to offend so many people uh, in, in so doing? And so, you know, the book was written, I should clarify. I began writing this book five years before the presidential election of a couple months ago. So Donald Trump was a reality TV star. Brexit was not a word in the English dictionary. These were not phenomena. White working class people, really people didn't even use the word working class in the United States. It was really reserved for Europe. These were things that took time to mature and evolve into the trends that we see today. Um, but it is, as a, as a social scientist, as a, as, a, as a researcher, exciting to see them come to fruition. Um, but leaving us with these really difficult, uh, challenging debates. And so my work really tries to help us understand these phenomena, the phenomenon of white working class people and their sense of marginality in societies that they once defined. So to get us there, I, I use this lecture as a, as a chance to sort of put out some ideas for you to think about, because I know that afterwards you'll have the opportunity to get into groups and to discuss it with yourselves, and then we'll return afterwards and I will take your questions that come kind of consolidate from your uh, thoughts in the group sessions that you guys have, which is a really, I think, a pretty uh, excellent and exciting way of actually addressing these things. Um, my remarks will go like this. I'm gonna begin with an oral history of Youngstown, Ohio. And the reason why I start with an oral history is because I want you to hear the histories that my subjects heard while I was in the field. This book was based on two ethnographies, one of Youngstown, Ohio, the other of uh, East London, it's called Barking and Dagenham, in England. And I'll focus on Youngstown because I want to focus on the United States in this talk, uh, but the book is comparative in nature. And I want you to hear the stories that my subjects heard about their city, about their town, about their country, and about the post-industrial life of the American Rust Belt, so that you actually are on the same page, because it is those stories that really create uh, the perceptions that people hold. And of course, a lot of these photos are coming directly from Youngstown, Ohio. Um, these for sure, but also if you'll see a few from Britain. Then I'll move into this question of how exactly can white people, working class or not, think of themselves as a minority in a country that they still possess enormous structural advantage in, legacies of, of discrimination and injustice in their favor, how can they continue to feel marginalized in these countries that they once defined and still in many ways predominate? The second question I'm going to try to address is, is white working class angst just old-fashioned racism? Can it be explained that simply? And then finally, I'll address the final question, which is probably also on your mind, is what drives white working class people to support Donald Trump? but also other far-right candidates and, and movements, uh, both here in the United States and elsewhere in Europe as well, okay? So I'll address each of those questions in turn. So first, let's just go to Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown used to be, there was a point when Youngstown was the Silicon Valley of the manufacturing era. People flocked to Youngstown from every corner of the world to work in their steel mills. They had about six or seven companies there with about 12 mills running, three shifts a day, 24 hours, every day, all day, and they had people who were working there for decent wages that rendered them stability, stable lives, nine to fives. You know, you didn't, your spouse didn't have to work. You could support a family of four or five on that income, and you weren't worried about losing your job because even if you did, you could get a job at the other factory the next day. And this is the oral history that's told in Youngstown today. And these factories weren't just a job. These factories were a lifestyle. They were a livelihood for a city. It was a factory, a, an industry town. The factories rendered not just a job. They also provided a social life. They supported newsletters and bowling tournaments and picnics. This was a, it's like a college campus, but not around education, but around the production of steel. 
And things were going very well for a very long time in Youngstown. They had a population of about 170,000 people around the mid-century. And then, one day, one Monday, September 19th, 1977, a day now known as Black Monday, the first steel mill suddenly shut its doors. Without any notice to its employees, just locked everyone out. And that sent into motion a domino effect in Youngstown, Ohio. One steel mill after the next shut its doors, closure after closure after closure, and after about five years, about 50,000 jobs were lost in an enormously, remarkably short period of time. So soon after that, you began to see that domestic abuse rates began to rise. Divorce rates started to skyrocket. Suicide rates began to rise. And eventually, by the late 1980s and early 1990s, little Youngstown, Ohio, was the murder capital of the United States of America. Today, if you go through Youngstown, Ohio, and let's just say you took a helicopter ride, and you look down at the city, you'll see patchy green places, little pastures, sprinkled around the center of the city where homes once stood. And these homes were burnt down, in many cases, by their owners in order to collect on the insurance because they had lost so much value. Arsonry is rampant. Many other spaces, though, were homes that were purposefully demolished by the Youngstown city government because they had been abandoned by their owners and turned into heroin dens and bordellos. And to remove the urban blight, they took down the houses. Youngstown is a city that has a skyline a, that's untouched by modernism. It has a, a football stadium with 20,000 seats. It has a world-class American art museum. It has neoclassical architecture. It has a park, Idora Park, that was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted of Central Park fame. But today, if you go to Youngstown, it's like you are driving through this lost Atlantis of rust and brick and mortar. It is a shell of its former self. And it has also changed demographically. That city bustling of 170,000 people in Northeast Ohio is now down to about 65,000, a third of its highest population in a matter of a half century. And a population that was once about 90% white and largely working class is now about 50% black, 50% white. And it's not that black people didn't leave Youngstown like white folks did. Everyone left Youngstown. You don't lose 110,000 people without everyone getting out. They just didn't leave as fast. And so Youngstown has undergone a remarkable amount of economic change with the decline of the manufacturing economy. It has undergone an enormous amount of social change and an enormous amount of demographic change. And so this amount of change all at once in a very short period of time has left a city that is literally stunned. And the oral history that I just shared with you consumes Youngstowners. It is told by a grandmother to the grandkids, mom to the kids, dad to kids, great-grandfather to their great-grandkids every day. And you hear it all the time in Youngstown today. Things were so good, those factories used to pump out soot and it would drizzle down onto people's windshields and they'd wipe it off and say, pay dirt. Boy, those times are gone. And white working class people in that city, along with various other places in the Rust Belt of the United States and Europe, in my interviews, expressed a sense of marginality. That they suddenly had become minorities, disempowered minorities in the countries and societies that they once knew. So let's get to that first question. How is this possible? How can we understand a group possessing that much power, or at least the vestiges of it, 
feeling so weak, feeling so frustrated, feeling so marginalized. So I argue that there are three key components to how white working class people feel marginalized. And remember, by the way, that I'm the messenger, right? So I'm not telling you how I feel. I'm telling you how my subjects feel. And these are their perceptions. And in politics, perceptions matter more than reality. So what are those perceptions? First, white working class people feel a profound sense of outnumbering. Remarkable, right? In the United States, white people make up about 60% of the country. In Britain, it's 80%. Sure, objectively, they are not outnumbered. But there's a sense of outnumbering that comes from the relative change in demography. So if you're living in a place like Youngstown, where white working class people were once 90%, and you are now 50% of the population, you don't necessarily see that you maintain some sort of predominant status in that society, or at least in your country. All you see is the relative loss of your predominance. They feel outnumbered. The second component is that white working class people often feel external. They feel like they have been made external to the power brokers, to the people in society who are determining public policy, business interests, they, to government. They feel like they are external to those processes that they used to feel more internal to, that they used to have a voice. And just to back this up a little bit to help understand, a recent book by a colleague of mine from Duke University, Nick Carnes, finds that in the American Congress, the percentage of representatives of working class backgrounds is 2%. Notice that I said working class backgrounds, not white working class backgrounds. A fraction of them are white. So the idea that they have a seat at the, the table as white working class people is a daydream of times lost from their perspective. They feel like they do not have a hand in the government that controls them, that manages their country. The third perception that underpins this idea of marginality is that white working class people often feel discriminated against. They feel like they are discriminated against on the basis of being white and on the basis of being poor. That they are relegated and dismissed as rednecks, hicks, hillbillies, white trash. And that they lose jobs or access to housing or access to social services because of this discrimination. And these three components outnumbering, externality, and discrimination, underpin this idea that they have become a minority in the countries that they once defined, rightfully or wrongfully. And in many cases, my subjects used the language of the civil rights movement, returning to Tom's opening, to actually define this sense of disadvantage in their own countries. They yearn for the days when there was a sense of social justice. They talk about evening the playing field. This turns the tables of the civil rights movement around, and yet for many white working class people, they think that the tables have been turned on them. Is this just plain old racism? Question number two. It's complicated. It's complicated. Racism permits us to create this duality, this simple duality of either you're a racist or you're not a racist. When in so many instances, race and racism is inextricable from so many feelings that there exists this broad grayscale in between the two. And from my perspective, I think 
it's very complicated to make these kinds of determinations. Let me ask you three questions, okay? And you, deter I'm a, you tell me if these things are racist. Note, by the way, that I am not a racism referee. It's not on my CV. It wasn't in the introduction. I am not the racism referee. You can be racism referees. Feel free. Is it racist to be against immigration because you associate it with a global system of commerce that has taken jobs offshore and dropped wages? Is it racist to be against affirmative action policies or advocacy campaigns that give preferential treatment to certain subgroups in the population? Is it racist to lament the poor representation of poor white people in government or society? My point here is not that this is not racist or that race has nothing to do with these statements. My point is that these are not overtly racist things to say and that there's something far more complex underneath. I began to become very sensitized to the power and the weakness of the concept of racism when I was out in the field. Because when I was, initially at least, when I was in Britain, a lot of my subjects would say to me, they'd preface their statements by saying, now I'm not a racist, but dot, dot, dot. And a lot of you are holding your breath, and you're saying, oh boy, here it comes. And I did too. I said, okay, here comes a, something that's going to be pretty racist. And it, sometimes it was. And sometimes it was. I'm not a racist, but this whole town's been taken over by blacks and Bosnians. That was said to me. Why Bosnians? No idea. <laughs> okay? But this clearly struck a nerve. This person was not happy about the Bosnian people in his town. But in other cases, they said things that were not necessarily obviously racist or kind of beside the point, but they still prefaced their statements by saying, now I'm not a racist, but, and I said to myself, now what's going on here? Are these people like, you know, and this is like several dozen subjects, are these people going through sensitivity training? No. And what I began to realize is that racism as a concept is viewed by many white working class people as a instrument, as a tool to invalidate what they think. Don't listen to what she has to say. She's a racist. What he believes is irrelevant because he's a racist, so it, inf you know, it infuses everything he thinks. You can't believe in anything that. Racism to white working class people is viewed as a mute button that you press on someone when they're trying to say what they believe. It invalidates what they're about to say. It disqualifies them from speech. And so they view racism not as the powerful concept that it was invented to be, a concept that made all of us more aware of our inherent prejudice and bias, but rather as an instrument a tool to silence them. And this is why it was so powerful when Donald Trump lamented the political correctness brigade imposing this racism litmus test, disqualifying certain people because they were quote unquote racist. That is why it was so powerful when someone like Donald Trump praised the importance of this silent majority that he was referring to. Why were they silent? Because they were silenced. And many believe that racism is a way to silence people. Now, some of you are surely thinking, but Justin, your subjects, they're white. They benefit from these legacies of advantage they benefit from those invisible wages of whiteness that you don't necessarily even know are there, but, but, but receive the benefits of. The privilege that comes with being white in societies that prioritize white people's needs or don't prejudge them in the same way as people of color. But if you tell that to my subjects, they will look 
at their lives and they will look at their trailer and they will look at their apartment and they will look at their lives when they are one unexpected medical bill, one car accident away from homelessness and they'll say, what wages are you talking about? What privilege are you referring to? It's very, very complicated. And it's not an easy conversation to have with the folks who are white working class. Which brings me to Donald Trump. Why do people support Donald Trump when they are white and working class? What was the source of his power? So this actually takes me back to my first book on Muslims, as Tom kindly mentioned. So in that book, what I found was that the folks who I were, was interviewing and studying, I was interested in whether they be, were active Democrats, not like capital D Democrats, but like democratically active, engaged, whether they were withdrawn and said, add to hell with the system, or whether they were radicalized and supporting extremist groups. And I spent a lot of time in the field inside meetings of extremist groups, legal extremist groups, a group called Hizb tahrir And I was interested in what drives people towards radicalism. And what I found was that it was a sense of deprivation, a sense that there is the way the world ought to be and the way the world is. And the larger the discrepancy between these two, the more likely my subjects were to be radicalized. And I said to myself, well, why wouldn't this also be true of white working class people? Yes, there is no Hizb tahrir for white working class people, but there are radical candidates and, and movements that appeal to them. Perhaps the determinants of that, that appeal are in that discrepancy between, between the way the world is and the way the world ought to be. But what I found when I was in the field was that it wasn't so much about the way the world ought to be. It was about the way the world used to be. What motivates white working class politics and their support for radicals and radicalism is a sense of nostalgia. It's the discrepancy between how the world is today and how it used to be, how it once was. And that's why Donald Trump was such a powerful candidate for that particular subgroup. Think of his slogan, make America great again. And the again is the important part to hear because everyone wants to make America great. You don't want to make America worse. But when you say the word again, it is implying pretty overtly that America used to be pretty great and now not so great. And that slogan is very much in the eye of the beholder because for a, a good half of the United States, they look back into our past and they don't see greatness. They see structural disadvantage, oppression, the privilege that we talked about. They see injustice and social ills. They see corruption and smoky room and dealings. But for another half of the United States, they think like Youngstown. They think about that soot popping up, you know, pluming into the air, drizzling down, graphite shining in the sunshine onto people's porches. They think about stable jobs, factories moving. You didn't need anything more than a high school degree to be able to maintain a nice lifestyle. They remember knowing their neighbors. They remember keeping a job their whole lives, just like the way their grandparents talked about. So when Donald Trump says to them, make America great again, that sounds pretty good. Because for them, the future is pretty bleak. The future is a non-manufacturing future, right? It is a post-industrial future. It is a future of automation, mechanization, robotics, the white working class people of today's Rust Belt in the United States, but also in Europe, 
that future sets that they're outmoded, that they're anachronistic, and that they're not going to be able to catch up in time to participate. And so Donald Trump's campaign was not just a referendum on race, if it was a referendum on the past. And of course, for many people who are members of minority groups, those two things are inextricable. How can we look at the American past without discussing its legacy of race and racism? But for many white working class people, they don't see racism when they look back in time. For them, that white privilege that I mentioned, those wages of whiteness, for white working class people, that privilege is what the ocean is for fish. You've been swimming in it your whole life. You don't even know it's there. And so for so many in this self-fashioned minority who understand their minoritization, in the sense of powerlessness, that they are enduring the powerlessness that blacks in America once did, that Latinos once experienced. For them, the only way to consider, to conceive of a post-traumatic future is to put and bring back and reestablish the pre-traumatic past. Thanks very much, guys. I'll turn this over to Tom, and we'll open up for, I think, some group discussions.